Chapter 39, Section 3, Nixon's Foreign Policy Record. Early in his political career, Richard Nixon had made a name for himself as a staunch opponent of communism. As president, however, he was determined to reshape America's containment policy. He hoped to replace endless conflict with a stable world order in which the superpowers could coexist peacefully. Nixon's realistic approach to foreign affairs. Nixon based his foreign policy on Realpolitik, a German term that means the politics of reality. It refers to politics based on practical rather than idealistic concerns. Nixon's top foreign policy advisor, Henry Kissinger, backed him in this realistic approach. As part of their Realpolitik approach, Nixon and Kissinger concluded that the United States could no longer bear the full burden of defending the free world. Addressing the nation in 1969, the president laid out his plan, which became known as the Nixon Doctrine. He promised that the United States would continue to protect its allies from Soviet or Chinese nuclear attacks. In other cases of aggression, however, the United States would expect the nation at risk to do more to help itself. The president's plan for Vietnamization of the war in Southeast Asia was an early application of the new Nixon Doctrine. The president also applied the Nixon Doctrine in the Persian Gulf region of the Middle East. With their vast deposits of oil, Persian Gulf nations had become increasingly important to the United States. However, the United States had no military forces stationed in the region. Rather than try to move troops in, Nixon sent military aid to Iran and Saudi Arabia. With this aid, he hoped these allies would take on the responsibility of keeping the region peaceful and stable. At the same time, the United States continued to support its closest ally in the Middle East, Israel, with both military and financial aid. The limits of the Nixon Doctrine became clear when Israel was attacked by a coalition of Arab countries led by Egypt and Syria during the Yom Kippur Holy Days in October 1973. The Yom Kippur War lasted just three weeks, but that was long enough to trigger the oil embargo. Despite receiving American aid, Saudi Arabia backed the embargo to punish the United States for its long-standing support of Israel. In dealings with the Soviet Union and Communist China, Nixon and Kissinger pursued a policy of détente. Détente is a French word that means a relaxation of tension or hostility. To many conservatives, détente seemed inconsistent with Nixon's earlier anti-communism. Some also saw it as a sellout of U.S. interests and ideals. Most liberals, however, applauded any policy that had the potential to prevent a nuclear holocaust. Opening Diplomatic Relations with China The policy of détente brought a dramatic change in U.S. interactions with China. When Nixon took office in 1969, the United States did not engage in diplomatic relations with China, nor did it officially recognize the communist government that had ruled mainland China since 1949. Nixon believed that the policy of isolating China had worn out its usefulness. In 1970, he reported to Congress that it was in America's national interest to improve practical relations with Peking. Beijing. The president had several reasons for wanting better relations with China. One was the sheer size of that nation. One-fifth of the world's population lived in China. In addition, Nixon had watched the relationship between China and the Soviet Union change from one of communist comrades to one of hostile neighbors. He believed that establishing friendly diplomatic relations with China might pressure Soviet leaders who feared Chinese power to cooperate more with the United States. In April 1971, a sporting event opened the way for détente. The Chinese government had invited a U.S. table tennis team to play in Beijing. The 15 team members were the first Americans to visit Beijing since the communists took power. Chinese leaders treated the American athletes as though they were ambassadors. At a meeting with the team, Chinese Premier Zhou Enlai stated that the athletes' arrival in China marked a new chapter in U.S.-China relations. Shortly after the table tennis competition, Nixon announced proposals to begin trade and travel between the two countries. Months later, Kissinger secretly traveled to China. In July 1971, Nixon announced that he would visit China the next year. The following February, Nixon and his wife Pat made an official state visit to China. While there, Nixon pledged to establish formal diplomatic relations between the two countries. He described the trip as bridging 12,000 miles and 22 years of non-communication and hostility. 
The historic visit marked a turning point in relations between the United States and the world's largest communist nation. The trip led to the communist government, based in Beijing, taking over China's seat in the United Nations. Until that time, the nationalist government of Taiwan had occupied China's seat. In 1973, the United States and China opened information offices in each other's capitals. By 1979, the two countries engaged in full diplomatic relations. Working towards detente with the Soviet Union Nixon's expectation that by improving relations with China, he could push the USSR towards detente proved accurate. Just three months after visiting China, Nixon embarked on another historic journey. In May 1972, he became the first American president to visit Moscow, the capital of the USSR. Soviet leader Leonid Brezhnev had invited Nixon partly in response to Soviet concerns about U.S. involvement with China. The invitation had also revealed Brezhnev's desire to receive U.S. economic and technological aid. Brezhnev and Nixon were able to negotiate a trade deal that benefited both countries. The United States agreed to sell to the USSR at least $750 million worth of grain over a three-year period. The grain deal helped the people of the Soviet Union, which was not growing enough grain to feed its population. It also helped American farmers, who were happy to sell their surplus grain. The two leaders then negotiated a much more difficult agreement, to limit the number of nuclear missiles in their arsenals. Such an agreement had been made possible by the development of spy satellites in the 1960s. Cameras mounted on these satellites took photographs that, when sent back to Earth, allowed the two countries to monitor each other's missile sites. The Strategic Arms Limitation Talks, SALT, later called SALT-1, was a five-year agreement. The treaty limited the USSR to 1,618 missiles and the United States to 1,054. The United States accepted the smaller number because its missiles were more advanced. The deal applied to both ground-based intercontinental ballistic missiles, ICBMs, and submarine-launched ballistic missiles, SLBMs. In addition, Nixon and Brezhnev signed a statement of basic principles, which called on both of the superpowers to do their utmost to avoid military confrontations. Nixon was pleased with this first agreement to halt the arms race. The historians of some future age, he predicted, will write that this was the year when Americans helped to lead the world up out of the lowlands of constant war and to the high plateau of lasting peace. Over time, however, hope that detente would lead to an era of cooperation between the superpowers began to fade. The USSR continued to support armed struggles in the Third World. It also began arming its missiles with multiple warheads in order to work around the treaty's limits. As a result, conservative critics of detente concluded that the Soviet Union should never be trusted again.